Thank you. Good morning, church. I'm so glad that you've chosen to come and gather in this place to worship this morning. We're here because we worship a Savior who is not dead in the grave, but is alive and at work in the world today. So if you would, please stand with us and let's sing to him this morning. to know that everything is going to be perfect when you walk out this door? 
Wouldn't that be awesome when we walk into a brand new world where everything's perfect? Here's what God said to a bunch of people who were wanting that so desperately in the book of Isaiah. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert and rivers in the badlands. Because I provided water in the desert, rivers to the sun-baked earth, drinking water for the people, the people that I made especially for myself, a people custom-made to praise me. Let's praise our God for the new thing He is doing. heart revival We long for a soul awakening A hope to wake us from our sleeping To see you resurrecting everything Like the wind turns to spring Like the desert turns to spring Doing a new thing, doing a new thing. Like the rain on thirsty ground, Holy Spirit pouring out. You're doing a new thing, You're doing a new thing. Come now, lead us into freedom, cause we don't want to stay the same oh god you turn on morning and your dancing with you the old has passed away like the wind that turns to stream like the deserts turn to streams you're doing a new Tiffany, we all have fears and worries and concerns about what other people are doing, what they're going to say, or how they're going to treat us, or how they feel about us. And again, Isaiah has some very poignant words from the Lord for us today. He says, as everything is breaking down, he says it in this language, for the mountains may move 
and the hills may disappear, but even then my faithful love for you will remain. My covenant of blessing will never be broken, says the Lord who has mercy on you. And he goes on to say, but there comes a day when no weapon formed against you will succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. I, the Lord, have spoken. Come calling my name My God is so much bigger Than troubles I face Why would I hunger For power or riches or fame God is so much better than all of these things. So I won't be shaken. I won't be moved. Cause my God is faithful. His promise is true.
Take your hearts to the Lord this morning. Leave them at his feet. Let's worship him.
as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found It is a pleasure to be with you on this Father's Day. For those that don't know me, my name is Evan Henson. I'm the college pastor here, and I'll be here in uh, Bobby's place while Bobby spends a couple days with his son and grandson in Dallas. Uh, It is always an honor to open God's Word with you. Um, Something you should know about me, I, uh, I watch TV when I go to bed, always have. Uh, always will, I think. Um, and now we have a really cool technology called sleep timers. And so when I go to bed, uh, every time, same show, and uh, I put the sleep timer 30 minutes, and then I uh, fall asleep, and it doesn't bother me. But when I was growing up, my parents wouldn't let us have a TV in our room, but my brother and I found uh, what we thought was an ancient TV at my grandmother's house. Had the little knob that you pushed in to turn on and pulled out to turn off, and it had a knob underneath that that got you channels 1 through 13, and then you hit to the X, and that got you to the bottom knob that got you 14 through 33 in Dallas, uh, CW. Uh, And so we would watch whatever sitcom was on that night, and then we would fall asleep, and inevitably, I would wake up at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning to infomercials. There's always something different. Sometimes it was a compilation of worship songs that would wake me up. Other times it was Miracle Blade, fascinating me every time, cut through a can of Coke, and then immediately cut through a tomato without even smashing it. But sometimes, and the one that fascinated me the most, was ShamWow. And in ShamWow, he takes a piece of carpet, dumps a two liter of Coke on this piece of carpet, takes his ShamWow towel, sets it on top, two pats, picks it up, rings out two liters of Coke into a clear bowl, picks up the carpet, dry as a bone, no soda seep through. Now, we have, as seen on TV, aisles at Walmart now, and you can go pick up a ShamWow. But what I want you to know is if you go home, and if you dump a two liter of soda on your carpet, and then you drop that ShamWow, give it two pats, and then ring it over a clear bowl, you will not, in fact, ring out two liters of soda. Your carpet will not be dry and stain free and you will have liquid underneath your carpet. And now they've gotten worse because now in every single kid's show, they've got quick infomercials. And now I'm the bad guy as I try to communicate to my kids it's never as good as they make it look on Disney Channel. $19.99 plus shipping and handling will not get you what these kids have. Assuming it comes in one piece, it won't stay in that state very long. It's not that good, I promise you. Unfortunately, I think we, being ministers, have sold you and other folks a, a bill of goods about what this walk with Jesus really looks like. We became fascinated. I say we, I wasn't alive in the 80s. Uh, They became fascinated in the 80s with getting people down the aisle. And so evangelistic crusades began to go around, and and Sunday morning everything was aimed at the invitation. And really cheap invitations were offered. Illustrations like, I've got a $20 bill. Does anybody want the $20 bill? And then, you know, somebody would raise their hand, they'd hand it to them, they'd go, that's salvation, free gift. You did nothing I gave it to you, and now you have it. And lots of people walked down lots of aisles. And then, life kicked them in the teeth, and they didn't know what to do. Life rears its ugly head, and they find themselves questioning whether any of that stuff they were told is actually true. We're going to look at a story this morning of somebody who did that. Now, we love to call Thomas Doubting Thomas. Without acknowledging that every single, let's 
go with adult in the room, has known someone who died. And if people came up to you in the immediate aftermath and said, hey, by the way, that person that you know is dead is actually not dead and is actually alive and he's coming over right now. 100% of us in the room would go, no, 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 no. I'm going to have to see that to believe it. Thomas does it, and we've labeled him forever, Doubting Thomas. But I want to look at Doubting John. We're going to be in Luke chapter 7. We were in Luke chapter 7 a month ago, not in this passage. uh, But we are going to be a little further up in Luke chapter 7. Jesus is on a miracle performing tour he is traveling city to city doing incredible things his fame is growing his fanboys are growing people are following him in fact he's going to have to address it in mark's gospel after he feeds the five thousand, people are continuing to follow him and he goes hey you don't even want my message you just want free lunch right people want to see this guy jesus I don't know how word traveled back then, but I remember being in Brazil my sophomore year. We are miles and miles and miles down the Amazon River from anything uh, symbolizing internet or cell towers. And yet, people knew we were coming and were there waiting for us when we would get to these villages. I don't know how the word traveled, but people hear about Jesus and they want to see some of this stuff. Luke chapter 7 Picking up in 18, the disciples of John reported all these things, all the miracles, culminating in the raising of the widow's son at Nain. So John summoned two of his disciples, and he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? When Jesus had Just then cured many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits, and had given sight to many who were blind. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. I know I'm not uh, great at giving you three points in a poem, and and they're never going to start with the same letter, but it's going to be a little bit more linear than normal, so I'll give you a heads up. We're going to look at... Uh, what John asked him, and uh, why he asked him that, and how Jesus didn't answer, which is an admittedly dangerous way to preach, uh, using one of your points as what isn't in the text. But then we'll finish with what Jesus did say. But what did John ask Jesus? John, the Baptist, says, Are you really the guy? John, The Baptist, who in the womb knew Jesus was something special, the moment he laid eyes on him when he was baptizing, he said, that's the one. He didn't need to go meet him and go, hey, I I think you're the guy, but remind me your name and then I'll tell you. Right? He, He said, this is the guy. I am unworthy to even untie his shoes. This is the one you're waiting for. If you've started to follow me, right? John's got a big following, even as a kind of a crazy itinerant preacher in the desert. He says, if you're here to follow me, you picked wrong. I'm only here to prepare the way for Jesus. And this is the Messiah. Jesus then approaches him and he says, Sir, I I cannot baptize you. You baptize me. And Jesus says, No. We're going to fulfill the scriptures. You're going to baptize me. And so John does. Which leads to the most significant and obvious declaration of Jesus' deity up until the resurrection. Without a close second. Heavens open up. Something like a dove descends upon Jesus' head. And then an audible voice from the clouds which declares, This is my son. That John asks this question. Now you need to understand, it's it's a bit loaded. You see, uh, not long before Jesus and John's time, there was another. 
one that nearly every Jew that knew anything about their tradition believed to be the Messiah. His name was Judas Maccabeus, Judas the Hammer. And Judas was what every Jewish family thought the Messiah would be. He was military, he was powerful, he was rebellious, and he led a small army and almost overthrew the Romans. The massive power of their time, almost defeated by a small band, a small army of Jewish people led by Judas Maccabeus. They thought they had the guy... Turns out he wasn't. And here we find John the Baptist going, maybe we were wrong again. Maybe we missed it. We're really confident then. I was really confident now. But maybe we, maybe we did get the wrong guy. So how do you go from baptizing a man, declaring him to be the Messiah, watching a clouds open, dove descending, voice out loud to going, well, maybe, maybe that wasn't it. And I think the answer is actually pretty simple. Life happens. Assuming you in this room know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, then assuming you realize what that means, you know that prior to knowing Jesus, you were dead in your sin, and after knowing Jesus, you are now alive in Christ. You have witnessed a miracle. And assuming you recognize the gravity of that, it's the same thing when we begin to go, well, maybe, maybe he's not everything I thought he was. Because when life starts to happen, those little voices in the back of our head go, maybe you were wrong. You see, John is not laid up in his uh, nice, large home, being fed grapes by his disciples and summoning a few that are not busy right now to go about and fetch his errands for him. John, the Baptist, who was commissioned as the person to prepare the way for Jesus, is sitting in a jail cell. He finds himself not at the right hand of Jesus, traveling around, being the one that introduces him at the parties. He finds himself alone in a dark, damp, stinky jail cell. So what do we do when life does not look the way that we thought it might? Or Jesus doesn't look the way he thought he might. You could not be any more different than Jesus and Judas Maccabeus. So neither of these things are lining up. My life is rough, and Jesus is not doing the things that I thought he would be doing. And it leads him to a crisis of faith where he begins to doubt whether Jesus is who Jesus said he was. Some of you may find yourself in that place right now. A true crisis of faith as you look around and life does not look the way you thought it would. Jesus doesn't look the way you thought he would. And you begin to ask the same question that they ask, God, are you, are you really who you said you were? Are you really the Messiah that was introduced to me when I heard the gospel and received it? How does Jesus not respond? If anybody ever had the right to tell someone else it was Jesus to John the Baptist to say, how dare you? I gave you a front row seat to the greatest display of my deity of all time. 
Maybe a hundred other people saw what John saw. Nobody saw it from the vantage point of John. You have trusted me since you were born all the way into your public ministry, and I am who I say I am, and now you want to doubt? If anybody had the right to say that, it's Jesus to John the Baptist. And yet he doesn't. It's almost as if Jesus is not intimidated by your questions and your doubts. I heard once, uh, doubt is a, a lovely place to visit, but a terrible place to reside. If, if you have never done the hard work of really going to God and going, I, I don't know that I believe this right now. Your faith has missed out on opportunities to be strengthened by God's continued goodness. Now, it is a terrible place to reside, and maybe you have been residing there longer than you'd even like to. But Jesus is not intimidated by your doubts, and to those of you in the room who currently don't have any doubts, and have opportunities to speak to other people who do, let's take a lesson out of Jesus' book and let's respond with grace and understanding and not shame on you. There is an entire generation, my generation, that is absent from most churches because when they came with questions just like John's, they were told, shame on you. And made to feel guilty about it. If Jesus is not afraid of the questions, maybe we ought to be able to respond in like kind. Now, I want to tell you something. If your grandson calls you, your granddaughter calls you, your next door neighbor comes over and they go, I am having all sorts of doubts. And you respond with utter grace and kindness. I am not promising you that they're going to go, you know what, I thought you were going to be rude and you weren't, so now I'm going to convert to your religion and now I'm saved. What I am telling you is nobody ever has been argued into the kingdom of God, so there's really no reason to waste your time trying. Every single soul who has come to know Jesus as a loving father and come to a saving relationship with him has been loved into that relationship first by the cross and second by his church. Every single one. And if you have ever won an argument and got someone to pray a magic prayer, I would call them this afternoon and apologize and tell them that just maybe they were argued into a faith outside of who Jesus is. I think we've got to learn to maybe respond a little bit more like Jesus when people have doubts. So how does Jesus respond? Here's, I want you to know, here's where I struggle. Patience. Right? I know God has given me desires and good good desires for uh, the way I minister and the, the way I move forward and who I get to minister and, and etc. And my biggest issue is not normally, okay, maybe I was wrong. It's normally, God, could you pick up the pace a little bit? Right? Maybe different for you. And so when I begin to pray, okay, God, I, I know you've given me this call, but I'm starting to wonder. I, I need you to pick up the pace. What I want God to do is go, my bad. I had gotten a little slow and I'm going to go ahead and do this faster so that you can now remember that I am who you am. You know what Jesus does here? He does the same thing he was doing before. And he says, go tell John what you've seen and heard. Do you remember how the passage opened? You go back and read it, 718. After John had heard these things, and Jesus' response is, go ahead and tell him the things that he's already heard. You know what Jesus' biggest defense is? Not my defense when people question my leadership. Well, let me change it up a little bit so that you feel better about the way I'm doing things. What, what Jesus' defense is, I'm still doing the thing I always was doing and always will be doing and remind John that. The problem is not that Jesus is not operating at the correct speed. 
The problem is not that Jesus has stopped doing things around you and the people that you love and in your family. It's that we are not seeing them anymore. And as badly as I want Jesus to respond by saying, I'm sorry I didn't do it your way. Let me do it better next time. Jesus says, I'm going to keep on changing lives and working in this world, and here's where I'm doing it. And he's tasked you and I to do the same thing. Remind people about his faithfulness. We have a, a word we use in, in church a lot, testimony. Right? When we talk about your testimony, what we really mean is uh, your faith story. The problem is, most of us do it wrong. You start out with, I was always a good kid. You weren't. And then you very quickly move through, and then I got saved. And then it's over. If you are ever, I want to forewarn you, if you are ever a witness on trial, and you're going to report the things you've seen and heard about a, a, a case, don't tell them what you ate for breakfast. Don't tell them uh, what the weather was like a couple weeks ago. They don't care. They want to know what you saw that is pertinent to the case at hand. If you are going to be a witness to something, certainly our story of faith, and it ends when you got baptized, nobody cares. What people want to know, what people are yearning for, even if they don't know it, is life change by the creator of the universe, all things seen and unseen. They don't care how bad or good you were before you knew Jesus. They want to know, what has Jesus done to change your life since then? And we have a responsibility as believers to talk about it. To tell people about the things you've seen and heard. You don't need a degree. You don't need a training seminar. You don't need to have X amount of Bible verses memorized. You don't need any answers other than this is how Jesus has changed me. This is where I'm seeing Jesus move. And guys, our threshold to talk about Jesus is so low. What if they don't agree with me? I won't do it. What if it makes things awkward from now on? I, I see him every day at work. I just, I won't do it. I don't really feel like it, so I won't do it. In Acts, Peter is taken prisoner. This whole thing with Jesus is getting out of hand at this point, and they go, you got to do something to stop this thing. So they take Peter in, and they deliberate, what are we going to do? And somebody says, well, if we kill him, there's going to be a riot, so we can't do that. That'd, that'd cause more problems. We well, okay, can't do that. We can't just let him go free, so let's beat him up and tell him to be quiet. So they do. They beat him up, and they tell him to be quiet. And you know what Peter says? He says, whether or not I, I follow you, whether you think that's right is up to you and God. Y'all can figure that out. But I cannot but speak about the things that I have seen and heard. People who have been so affected by the gospel that they decide to publicly proclaim it and then begin to turn everything in their life in a different direction cannot but speak about the things that they have seen and heard. It doesn't mean you can only wear the Mardell shirts with uh, sort of logos, but they're actually Jesus things on them. It doesn't mean uh, that, that everything you do has to right, change the direction so you can start quoting Scripture at people. Right? You're not selling essential oils. You don't have to turn everything to that conversation. You're simply talking about the way that Jesus has changed your life. And when you're open to it, what you'll find is conversations turn that direction a lot. Because people are, are hurting. 
People are searching. People are desperate. Yearning for something better than this. Which is an admittedly low bar. An answer to the pain that they feel. And guys, we have that. Go back and tell John what I've seen, what you've seen and heard. People are being restored. Good news is being shared with the poor. These are direct quotations from Isaiah about the suffering servant, the Messiah. I'm doing all the things that I always said I was going to do before you misinterpreted and recrafted me into something that looked more like what you were hoping for. I'm still doing the things I said I would be doing from the get-go. Go back and tell John. And then he says what seems odd, blessed are those who are not offended by me. Blessed just means happy, I hope you know, same word. Right? Happy, fulfilled, uh, satisfied are those who are not offended by me. The Greek word is scandalizo. Not too hard to figure out the transliterated word that we now have in English. Scandalized. I do hope you know the grace that Jesus meets out is scandalous who he gives it to. It's offensive. Jesus would be so willing to give us Grace to, right? We want to vet people first. We've all said it. Don't give that guy money. He's going to use it for something he shouldn't. I want to make sure, before I do something nice, I want to make sure you're going to do it back, right? There's nothing more offensive than opening a double door and they go out the other door and open it themselves, right? If, if I'm going to do something nice, right, then you go through my door. Thank you cards baffle me, by the way, just so you know. Really frustrated my mom never wrote those for the graduation presents. I thought, well, if it offends them that I did not write them a note to tell them thank you, then just don't buy me anything. I, I've never understood it. I, I, I wish I was better at thanking people, but I, I've never understood this uh, uh, like uh, out-kindness that we have to each be kinder, and then I have to reply. So if you compliment me, I can't say thank you. That's rude. I've got... I have to re-compliment you in a way that shows, right, we don't know how to do this thing. Right? We want to we make sure people measure up before I give out my kindness. I want to make sure they respond in the right day before I, or in the right way before I give out my kindness. I want to make sure they're going to accept it. I want them to, well, one, notice it, right? You want to talk about it? Even better. But the grace of Jesus is scandalous. Jesus has given it to people that had no business getting his grace. To live a gospel-centered life, I want you to know it's scandalous. You're going to find yourself in company that you didn't expect to want to be around. Unfortunately, company that maybe folks in the church would go, you sure you want to be around that guy? You sure you want to find yourself there? He says, blessed is the one that's not offended by the way I choose to operate. Because it's not going to line up with expectations. It's not going to line up with the way you think I ought to do it. That's right, Deuteronomy tells us, his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Jesus doesn't operate the way you and I would want to. And if we're not careful, we can get offended by that and go, hold on now. These are not the terms I agreed to. He says, blessed is the one that understands. Life doesn't always look the way we want it to, and Jesus doesn't always behave the way we would like him to. But he's still moving. He's still working. He is still the author and perfecter of your faith. He is still moving towards an end. And he hasn't stopped or slowed down since he started. 
Sometimes you need reminding, and sometimes you're the one reminding others. Look at what he's seen. Look at what he's done. Look at what he said. Look at how he's been faithful around us. Look at how he's been faithful in my life. And you'll find life is much more enjoyable when you go, okay, let's do it your way, Jesus, instead of being scandalized when he doesn't do things the way we think he ought to. Let's pray. God, you're good, and you're for our good. We're so grateful for that truth. Forgive us when we inevitably take it for granted. God, I pray that you would do something in and through the lives of the people in this room, in their homes, in their families, our workplaces, all throughout this city as we leave this place. Something that's so big we couldn't take credit for if we wanted to. Something that our only explanation would simply be God did that. It's your name I pray. Amen.